of you. Okay. And I assume while Tom is giving his comments, it'll just be him. I, yes, yeah. I'm going to hand it over to him after I'm done. And then if uh, Tom, if you want to go ahead and uh, share your screen now, we can just have it there up there uh, while I'm, it's up to you, or you could wait till I said, I'll pass it on to you and you can. So what it. is the flow? Do you want to make introductory remarks and then I'm I go introduce... or does Dave, I assume yes. that he might want to talk before well, me, we're... is that right? No, I'm going to introduce okay. um, and then I'm going to hand it over to you. So you're going to do your presentation and set the, set the stage. And then okay. after you're done with yours, Dave will come in and you go into the discussion. Okay. Sounds, sounds perfect. All right. So you want me, well, I'll let you be on camera first before I share slides and then I'll do it. Yes, that's fine. And people are just trickling in right now. So we'll give a, just a few more seconds for people that's to fine. come in. Well, you know, well, we're going to get started. We're also going to be recording this program. So I want to um, be respectful of everyone's time as people come in, they can join us. And I have a couple, uh, a, a few minutes of remarks before um, Tom will join us. So I just want to say, first of all, good evening to everyone. Welcome you to, um, to our program tonight. Thank you. Um, it's our March speaker program. Uh, tonight we have the, the honor of uh, hosting Mr. Thomas Boyke on Plagues and the Paradox of Progress, his latest book. Uh, my name is Xiaoyan Zhao. I am the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of Kentucky and Southern Indiana. We are a hub for international exchange, dialogue and learning located in Louisville, Kentucky. The World Affairs Council facilitates a variety of international professional and youth exchanges, speaker programs and educational opportunities for the Kentuckiana region year round. We are also nationally affiliated with the Global Ties US Network, the World Affairs Councils of America and the Sister Cities International. Today, I wanna to thank all of our members who uh, support uh, us through membership and that membership supports our mission of connecting our little slice of America here in Kentucky with the world and provide the uh, community with access to expert analysis and quality discussions on topics that impact us here and abroad. So today we are delighted to host Mr. Thomas Boyke, who's the director of the Global Health Program at the Council on Foreign Relations and author of Plagues and the Paradox of Pro Progress, Why the World is Getting Healthier in Worrisome Ways. Based on his research, Tom will provide some insights into how the COVID pandemic fits in the larger historical narrative and the impact of infectious diseases on global health and equality. Following Tom's presentation today, he will be joined by Dr. David Wigman, Academic Dean Emeritus of the University of Louisville School of Medicine and a proud WAC board member for a brief discussion before we move to the audience Q&A. So first of all, welcome to you both. We're very happy to have you. And before I turn it over to Tom for his presentation, just do a quick reminder for everyone um, for about the run of show tonight. We are recording this webinar and it is live streaming on Facebook. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during this program. We always look forward to the questions and comments from our audience. And you can use the Q&A function uh, in your Zoom or the chat box. So with that, I will now go ahead and pass it over to Mr. Thomas Boyke for his presentation. Tom? Great. Thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. It's a great pleasure uh, to be with all of you all, at least virtually. I wish it was in person. Um, but I'm uh, pleased to have this opportunity to speak with you tonight. Uh, the book I'm going to describe, uh, I'm going to put it in the context of our current pandemic, is about uh, humankind's struggles with infectious diseases and how those struggles have shaped our societies from our global geography of cities to the fortunes of economies to the movement of people. And 
The question I want to start with is how will our present pandemic or our current struggle with the novel coronavirus uh, affect us? What will be the ways that it will shape uh, the future of our society? So with that, let me bring up my presentation. Um, so when this pandemic ends, what will be its lessons? And I want to first acknowledge that uh, the great loss uh, that we've experienced uh, through uh, this pandemic since its emergence uh, in early, uh, or at least notice of its emergence in early uh, 2000 is caused nearly uh, 3 million deaths worldwide, including uh, more than 500,000 in the US, 300,000 in Brazil, uh, 200,000 in Mexico, and so on. Uh, COVID-19 has also cost the world a estimated $20 trillion in direct spending and reduced productivity, which is roughly one quarter of the world's global GDP. And this pandemic is far uh, from, from over. Um, the impact uh, has been disproportionately in the Americas and Europe, which have been responsible for 80% of the reported deaths from uh, the coronavirus. And this table shows you the dark red where the coronavirus or COVID-19 rather has been the leading cause of death. And uh, showing you that in general in high income countries, the, the impact has been worse uh, than being the second leading cause of death in 2020. So how do pandemics end? Well, typically they end in two ways. One is the medical ending when the incidents or deaths from uh, the pandemic begin to plummet. The other is the political, social ending when the fear of the epidemic wanes, the two of course being related. Uh, so one means is of course eradication, which is actually quite rare. Um, the WHO, World Health Organization, officially declared smallpox uh, eradicated in 1980 after a 25-year campaign uh, to uh, eradicate it. The last case of smallpox was found on October 26, 1977, just across Ethiopia's border with Somalia in a hospital cook named uh, Ali Malo uh, Amao Melon working in a town of Merka in Ethiopia. In some other instances, pandemics have faded for reasons that we still don't really entirely understand. So for close to 2000 years, the world suffered multiple waves of bubonic plague that killed millions from the plague of Justinian in the sixth uh, century to uh, the medieval plague, uh, the Black Death in the 14th century in the years between 1347 and 1351, uh, the plague killed a third of the European population, including half of the population of Siena, Italy, which is depicted in this painting. That uh, bubonic plague has not left us. You still have uh, resurgences that occur in the late 19th and uh, early 20th centuries. So, other than eradication or fading uh, for reasons that we can't entirely explain, another major driver of the decline of infectious disease historically has been uh, societal and public health reforms. And here I'd like to point out that the majority of our progress against infectious diseases in the United States and many other countries that are now wealthy occurred before the widespread public availability of antibiotics and the development of most vaccines. Uh, in fact, uh, more than 60% of the gains in life expectancy the United States has experienced since 1870 uh, accord, uh, or, uh, occurred before we had effective treatments for most infectious diseases. In more recent years, with uh, the development of effective medical interventions, uh, more pediatric vaccinations, 
uh, treatment uh, for HIV, uh, ways of controlling the, the means of spread for diseases like malaria. Um, we've seen more dramatic progress in uh, nearly all infectious diseases. So malaria deaths worldwide have decreased by 27% since their peak in 2003. Uh, deaths uh, from HIV AIDS have fallen uh, by nearly half since 2005. And tuberculosis, diarrheal diseases, uh, measles uh, have all declined um, uh, similarly dramatically since that time. And you can see that now for the first time in recorded human history, infectious diseases are no longer the majority, no longer cause the majority of death and disability in any region of the world. And that includes Sub-Saharan Africa. And that will remain true um, from what we know from reported numbers, at least after this coronavirus. So when will this pandemic end? And here I want to point out that uh, most that have uh, are following this closely do not expect this coronavirus simply to go away. We will not eradicate it with our current tools. And uh, um, uh, it's likely to be with us for some time. The reason for that is that uh, particularly in the US, for example, um, many of the individuals who will be eligible to be vaccinated will not be vaccinated. We can't vaccinate children. Um, so the virus is likely to continue uh, for some time. Our current vaccines may not provide full immunity against the, the, the variants uh, of the disease, but that doesn't mean that the the social consequences, the political consequences, the fear of this virus and its uh, unnecessarily extensive death toll don't have to end. And to think about that, it depends ultimately on whether we learn the lessons that this pandemic has been teaching us. And this gets to the, the theme that I set out for the book the way human society or the way our struggles with infectious diseases have shaped uh, human history. Now I concede my wife and friends found writing a book about how infectious diseases affect uh, societies and economies to be a rather gloomy preoccupation, um, but it isn't all about destruction and devastation. Infectious diseases have also been the driver of dramatic societal and governmental reform. They put a mirror to the societies that they inflict. They expose shortcomings in uh, what societies invest in and how they respond to the needs of the most vulnerable. In doing so, the need to overcome those epidemics of infectious diseases have provided the basis for uh, addressing uh, those shortcomings and improving the, the care that's afforded to the most vulnerable. Here's one example of the way that infectious diseases have shaped society. So uh, plagues helped create the modern uh, state. This is uh, a depiction of uh, the plague of Florence in 1348. Florence and Genoa were centers of trade routes uh, that had been scourged repeatedly uh, by plague, compelled to defend themselves, these city-states, uh, adopted a series of measures that largely affect, uh, invented public health. Many of the tactics that we now have heard so much about in this pandemic from quarantine to isolation, to social distancing, to plague units or infectious disease uh, isolation units, to your personal protective equipment like masks and protective gowns, all were invented in this era. You also needed to enforce quarantine. You needed navies and taxis and uh, uh, taxes rather, and magistrates of public health to administer quarantine and isolation and these other methods. These contributed to the creation of the modern state by forcing governments for the first time to assume responsibility of their own citizens, uh, not out of the goodness of their heart, but to protect their economies and protect elites under the recognition that protecting all of 
uh, society was the only way to protect themselves and their workforces. Again, as mentioned, societal reforms uh, really drove most of our gains in life expectancy in the United States. That has come through housing reforms uh, that reduced overcrowding in, in tenements, uh, public health innovations like the, the pasturation of milk, uh, labor laws that reduced the presence of children in factories and overcrowding on factory floors that uh, spread uh, respiratory disease like tuberculosis, uh, investments in clean water and sanitation in cities. And I should note here, the cartoon you see to your left is uh, the Thames. Uh, that individual there is the owner of one of the water companies and it showed that the intake of the water system, waterways were coming from the same place where the sewer was being emptied. Many cities effectively had circular water systems, people drinking their own waste. Having clean water uh, filtration and effective sanitation is attributed in the United States with 40% of the decline in child mortality that occurred at the beginning of the 20th century. These, city, these uh, reforms allowed cities to grow, uh, become uh, more wealthy, uh, to have all the benefits that you get from cities, trading ideas, starting new businesses, enjoying, reaping the benefits of common infrastructure. They also set the precedent for other public investments and social reforms. The same bond offerings and referenda that supported the creation of these sanitation systems were really the first municipal investment, municipal government investments. And they set the stage for investments in roads, railways, and ports. Compulsory immunization for smallpox was the four, one of the first social regulations and it set the stage for compulsory schooling later. It also set the stage for a lot of the international cooperation uh, that we've seen, particularly treaties. The first problem that nation states realized they could not solve on their own was infectious disease. And in 1851, the first sanitary uh, conference uh, began uh, producing uh, 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 began producing agreements that eventually led to a set of treaties that continue to this day to oversee uh, the global governance of dangerous disease events. Through HIV, reinvented the field of global health in foreign policy, leading to a resurgence of funding and a series of investments that expand to other disease groups or diseases like tuberculosis or malaria. Will we learn these lessons today? Will we take the lessons of what we've learned from addressing HIV to reinvigorate international cooperation around uh, the distribution of COVID-19 vaccinations? Will we turn the lessons that we've found about uh, the vulnerability of populations in a pandemic to address medical needs generally that left uh, the elderly and uh, Black and Latino and other uh, populations particularly vulnerable in this crisis. Will we finally invest in the public health emergency uh, and oversight that we need to uh, address the next novel disease for which there will not be initially an effective vaccine or any treatments? And this is ultimately what the lesson is, that as has been well demonstrated by this pandemic, the fight between humankind and microbe is not over. Despite our progress, we need to continue to invest in the areas where we've uh, managed to reduce child death and suffering. But we must recognize that our, the way we approach infectious disease, either domestically or internationally, needs to be embedded in a strategy that invests in the forms of public health oversight and societal development that can keep us safe even in the absence of effective medical treatments because that has been demonstrated in this pandemic that is a fragile reed on which to build the safety of our societies. And I will stop there. Uh, Tom, thank you very, very much. I appreciated your comments today and uh, certainly appreciated getting to read your book, which I'll hold up, but note that uh, 
I would recommend this to everyone. They, you'll have to buy your own uh, sticky notes. Uh, let me make a couple comments of, about the book first, because I think this book published in 2018 really leads into Tom's comments then about COVID. And this has been an area of interest to me for, for 50 years. And what Tom did in this book was take a lot of known information and some new and reconstruct it and put it together in ways that I had never thought about. And to me, it made the whole area a whole lot clearer. And so I think that uh, in itself is a wonderful reason to read the book. Uh, it really puts uh, pandemics in a global context and also in historical context. And I wanted to, before we get into questions, just read several very short quotes um, keeping in mind that this book was published before COVID and uh, quotes uh, new and previously unknown infectious diseases are likely to remain an ever-present threat to human life. And clearly that's happened. Uh, another quote uh, that Tom made in, in 2018, the risk of another great pandemic of infectious diseases is not behind us. Uh, clearly that's been the case. Uh, let me just read one or two more. Um, it, Tom noted that in 2013 at the World Health Organization, less than one half percent of, uh, inter, of uh, international health aid was devoted to building global responses to infectious disease outbreaks. And maybe uh, finally then to just note that Tom uh, indicated that Looking forward in 2019, the US funding for pandemic preparedness would sink to its lowest level in a decade. Uh, all of those, I, I think, uh, made this book from 2018 uh, really uh, informative of uh, where things were going. And I recommend it uh, to help you to fully follow the comments that, that Tom made today. Uh, I have just a few questions. But uh, I, maybe I'll, I'll ask the first one, based on the conclusions of your book and your comments today, uh, what, do you, what steps do you recommend the US take, uh, either alone or through world organizations? And let me combine that with, would you suggest a redirection of some of the Gates money, uh, for example, make to non-communicable diseases or to building better public health systems? Great. Um, so terrific question. Thank you for the kind remarks uh, about the book, um, first of all. Uh, so looking forward, what a major theme, as Dave suggested from the book and hopefully came across as in my remarks, is that, um, you know, the most durable forms of progress we've seen against infectious diseases have been the ones that we've undertaken through public health and our societies, um, less dependent on just medical treatments. Um, I worry a little bit about the lessons we will take from the current pandemic, where there have been many nations, um, arguably including our own, that have waited for a vaccine uh, to save us from this. And then there are many nations that did not wait and what science has achieved in this pandemic is remarkable. I mean, we had a vaccine in 10 months, which uh, previous record had been four years, um, but we still have suffered at least, and again, reported deaths are probably a significant undercount, 3 million deaths globally and $20 trillion in economic losses, despite the remarkable achievement of science in this crisis. The way I think we need to shift our investments in global health is historically what we have done is invested in the particular diseases we've wanted to address like HIV, malaria, or TB with the interventions we wanted to provide like antiretroviral drugs or insecticide treated bed nets. What we need to invest more in in the future is uh, health systems. Um, sounds not glamorous, but at the end of the day, you know, we've, we've spent 50 years largely circumventing 
the nation state in our response to infectious disease to provide uh, treatments, food, and in some cases funding. The future of global health really is how do we enable governments to take the lead in handling uh, the problems that only governments can handle. And that includes the effective detection, prevention, and response to emerging diseases like this coronavirus. Well, let, thank you. Uh, Tom, let me change directions completely because some of the people watching are young people. We have an educational program where some will be watching. And when you read your book, clearly you finished law school and went immediately to South Africa and found kind of your calling for life. Uh, I wonder if you have comments that you would direct to young people as the, they are approaching that time in their life. Sure, absolutely. So um, I had been uh, somebody who had focused on science. I come from both my parents were refugees to this country and I grew up in a science family and that was my uh, background. Um, but I had initially worked on some of the domestic challenges of health uh, in New York City during the height of the HIV crisis, again, pre-treatment. Um, and that really is what inspired me to go to, to do uh, law and policy instead of bench work, which I had been doing before. As Dave rightly points out, um, I was drawn to South Africa. I read in the back of the New York Times one day, late at night, after classes uh, about the treatment access crisis in South Africa, and it felt like an area in which uh, that law and policy could potentially resolve, that there was no reason to have such limited access in countries where pharmaceutical companies were not making very much money, that there had to be a way to align the interests to address that problem. Now, I was a little bit naive or overly ambitious in how quickly I thought that problem would get solved, but it really changed what I wanted to do. I dropped out of a second clerkship on the Ninth Circuit and instead moved to South Africa to spend a year and a half working on this, and I've uh, never regretted it. So I guess the lesson to have that long way of getting around to Dave's question is, um, you know, uh, used to look for your opportunities uh, to uh, address the important problems of this world and take a risk. Um, sometimes, particularly when you're young, it pays off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, reach out so, so that uh, uh, time doesn't leave you behind. Let me change to a totally science uh, question. And that is, uh, uh, in your book, you discuss uh, the terrible conditions in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and Southern Asia. But yet, with COVID, we're finding uh, the incidence of disease, at least as reported, uh, to be a tenth of what we might have expected. Any thoughts on why that is? It's a great question. And I will say it is uh, somewhat still of a mystery, although we're working on it. Um, uh, we will say, I'll say a couple of things. There's no question there's underreporting in some regions, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa alone, but seroprevalence studies that have looked at the region are still finding the rates of cases significantly lower than what they are in high income countries and particularly um, from what we can identify deaths. So what explains that? Um, some of the reduced death toll might be the fact that populations are a lot younger. Uh, you have a lot less prevalence of obesity, a uh, lot less prevalence of some other high risk factors that have driven uh, some of the really bad outcomes. It's from that perspective, not quite as surprising that the Euro Europe, the US and Latin America have done as poorly as they have from a death perspective. But some of it also may be the ways we engage with our uh, governments, that early on in a pandemic, the only way to keep people safe is for them to trust the information that is emerging about how they can protect themselves. And the one result that seems to have a very strong 
uh, correlation with what we've seen in terms of the patterns death internationally is government trust. Countries that have higher government trust by and large, or to put it in the reverse, countries that have low government trust have done poorly in this pandemic. And it may be that they're not following, you've had the breakdown in following the types of strategies that can keep individuals safe. So there's no one answer. The combination of biological factors, demographics, and perhaps you know issues that we still need to address in some societies, low trust societies are, are at work. Thank you. Let me uh, turn to a question from our audience. And, and this uh, uh, person asked, uh, might this pandemic bring to light our untapped talent in creating better, more equitable public health structures? Somewhat uh, that, but. Lord, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Very much untapped, unfortunately. Uh, but we, uh, it, it may. I mean, I think particularly there has been, I mean, as I mentioned in my initial remarks, there's lots of ways that pandemics have moved the world to a, uh, a fairer, more prosperous in direction in the past. And one would hope that would occur here. I do think there's, for instance, in the United States, a lot greater appreciation about the healthcare inequities that exist across uh, racial and ethnic groups than there were previously. Um, you know, some people had observed that with maternal uh, mortality, particularly amongst uh, uh, Black Americans, but I think people now have somewhat of a greater appreciation about exactly how systemic that is. That might be one outcome. Uh, the big issue for us is can we, at a time now where this is fresh in people's mind, can we address these challenges both domestically and internationally because the window is short. And again, with the heavy focus currently on vaccines, I worry a little bit that we may lose our opportunity to remember the, the lessons that the pandemic had been teaching us before this. Let me uh, turn back taking that question. And as I said, your book really uh, was not just narrowly focused. It put things in a broader perspective and uh, so just to put a few of the things together that you brought up uh, several times each, uh, climate change you, you brought up and certainly the problem with uh, decrease in amount of land that people could actually use, uh, the uh, uh, immigration that will likely re result from that and the increasing in national nationalism which counters Im immigration uh, you talked about exploding population in underdeveloped countries. Uh, several times you, you point out you expect the uh, next 20 years to be more violent. And uh, obviously there's a continued spread of nuclear weapons across the world. So uh, my question, big question is, is there a reason not to have a doomsday uh, feeling when you put all those together? Or do you see this as, as more a warning that can be acted on? I very much see it as a warning that can be acted on. Um, this is not a population bomb book. Uh, some of you that may not remember that, uh, a book inspired, Paul Ehrlich wrote it in the 70s, inspired by his visit to urban India and feeling that overwhelmed. So it was this book predicting uh, great disasters worldwide from, from overpopulation. Uh, for the most part, you know, uh, people have referred to it in development circles. So do you believe in more people means more brains or more stomachs? And ultimately, I believe more people means more brains. Uh, and we've been able to stay ahead of many of these challenges. That said, one thing I want to caution on is that there are a lot of stiff headwinds for countries that are going uh, through their transition from infectious diseases and growing as societies that there weren't then. Um, the book is filled with stories and it points out that, you know, we've seen this before in many societies where health improved and child mortality declined and you saw large um, increases in young adult populations 
which if there weren't jobs for them, they ultimately moved. So the book tells the story of the potato famine in Ireland, and a lot of people don't realize that the large emigration from Ireland started three years before the famine and was largely spurred by the fact that you had better nutrition in Ireland. It was much safer than, or had, I'm sorry, less, uh, uh, better health circumstances in England and Wales, uh, but very little employment. And people faced with a life of tenant farming did what you or I might do with faced of a life of tenant farming. They moved to where there were more opportunities. We're expecting and already seeing each uh, dramatic increases in the young adult population in Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of South Asia. And you're seeing patterns of migration largely follow that. And if we want a uh, different outcome there, um, we largely need to invest in the economic opportunities that can get people to stay. And as Dave rightly points out, we've been a little bit inconsistent in this where many Western countries are, uh, would like to reduce uh, uncontrolled immigration at the same time that they also want to reduce manufacturing from low and middle income countries. And those two goals work at cross purposes. Uh, Xiao Yin, uh, do we have any ad additional questions from our audience that I'm not seeing? Not right now, Dave. So if oh. you have, keep on going with your conversation. Okay. We, <laughs> We, we, we will. I think you're, you're all answering all the questions that we ever want to know about plagues. Well, and well that's, that's so. <laughs> great. That's, that's a successful conversation. We could be having uh, dinner while we enjoy it after, the, after COVID. Uh, I'm, I might ask a, a more political, but not, not politically divisive question. Uh, we have the large numbers of people uh, in the, this country, but worldwide who uh, are very resistant to uh, being uh, receiving the vaccination for COVID. Um, any, any thoughts in ways that we could, uh, uh, based on the kinds of information in your book and in your talk, that we might uh, be able to reach a greater uh, percentage of the population? Because obviously the concept of herd immunity is incredibly important, especially since we don't know how long the uh, the vaccinations will last as far as their effectiveness. That's right. So uh, there are three constraints on vaccination and we've really only focused on one of them uh, generally. The first is supply. Can we make enough of the vaccine to meet uh, the global needs or domestic needs? The second is administration. If we had the vaccines, can we actually distribute it and get it into the arms of the people who would benefit most from that vaccination. The last is demand. Uh, can we have people um, build the demand for the vaccine so that the people who would benefit most from it want to take it? Um, particularly in the United States, but more, even more so globally, we've really focused on making the vaccine and very little until recently on the administration and demand constraints there. That's going to be a big challenge. We're going to quickly move in this country from being supply constrained to being demand constrained, where we are trying to make sure that, again, the populations who could benefit most uh, will take this. And it's the early polling data is not breaking down uh, the way you might suspect from reading the press. We had many health workers who uh, delayed vaccination. Um, we, uh, you've actually seen increasing interest in being vaccinated among uh, Black and Latino populations. Many people were concerned about still much more progress to be made, but they're declining. Um, but we do see a political divide in people's willingness to be vaccinated or interest in being vaccinated, and that isn't declining. So we have some real work to do domestically on that. Generally what people advise are members of those communities being the messengers. Um, 
in terms of trying to uh, engage. But this was an area we were slow to invest in uh, early on in the vaccine rollout, and we're still just, just in the early days of getting better at it. Uh, internationally, we see a lot of it as well. One last thing I want to cite, both domestically and internationally, is the role of misinformation and disinformation on social media. And this is in one way in which democracies are at a disadvantage uh, in this pandemic, where um, we, we really have struggled with ways of controlling this misinformation and disinformation that we're seeing. Um, we're starting to make steps towards uh, um, deplatforming people on those outlets. And that's something that comes very unnaturally to Americans. Um, but uh, there is some, the evidence shows uh, it to be among the most effective things we can do and particularly in a pandemic, uh, certainly worthwhile seeing done where there's evidence that it's necessary. Thank you. Uh, our audience has sent in a couple more questions. So let me uh, read the first of those. Uh, the, the viewer writes, I read a recent account of why the West failed with COVID mitigation. One thing it mentioned was how leaders in the West waited to see higher case numbers to apply things like lockdowns. How do you think we could get leaders in the future to act quicker and more decisively in order to actually uh, mitigate a virus? Great, so I think we need a, a couple of things here. Uh, historically on uh, Dave is right. We've had a dramatic underfunding of pandemic preparedness, both domestically and internationally. When he cited that quote from the book, it sadly has remained uh, true. It remained true after the Ebola outbreak. It may remain true after SARS and H1N1. This is just not a area where we've had sufficient investment. To the extent we've had, it's mostly been on capacity, but not readiness. And what I would argue has emerged from this crisis is that we first need information sooner. Uh, that's not just a China-specific comment. Um, we've actually seen it in other epidemics as well, including in West Africa and the Democratic Republic of Congo. We can no longer rely on a system globally that is uh, dependent on the self-reporting of affected nation states. They all report late. And uh, particularly after we've seen widespread uh, use of travel restrictions and the economic consequences in this pandemic, governments are going to have greater motivation to report late in the future. So we need a system that isn't as dependent. And one thing that we've proposed at the council is a hospital-based sentinel surveillance system that monitors, you know, for instance, pneumonia of unknown origin, just regular rates, anonymized data, but tries to pick up patterns uh, globally that might lead to a signal that can be a, a supplementary form of surveillance to help identify outbreaks earlier. At a minimum, uh, this outbreak had emerged in uh, the earliest case that's been confirmed is in the beginning of December. Uh, having information arrive sooner may have made some difference. The second is to not just focus on capacity, but focus on readiness. Uh, many, most governments had done very little to rehearse pandemic response beforehand. Uh, we didn't have triggers in place of when we would act on, based on what we were seeing internationally. And these are two areas where people have focused on that perhaps we can do better next time um, I frankly agree with the questioner that, you know, one of the things that occurred in this case is we were fighting the last war. Everyone assumed this would be SARS or Ebola and largely stay uh, where the virus would stay contained largely where it emerged. And I honestly think it was not until uh, Italy's healthcare system really started to be overwhelmed and you start to see the disasters emerging from that, that high income countries finally appreciated, fully appreciated the risk. And we didn't just rely on travel restrictions, we started to take measures uh, in addition to that to keep ourselves safe. 
And uh, that unfortunately cannot take so long next time. We have to have to be ready uh, to implement those sooner based on what we're seeing internationally. Thanks. Uh, there's been discussion on the news uh, about requiring uh, uh, some on your passport or that type of thing to travel internationally showing that you've had the COVID vaccination. There's been a lot of pushback against that. But I can remember in traveling specifically having to demonstrate a yellow fever uh, uh, vaccination. So what, what are your thoughts on uh, that, that issue as, as part of free, freedom of choice uh, versus kind of medical uh, responsibility? Great, so, and really terrific way to phrase the question. So much of what we've seen uh, in this pandemic have been at that intersection of freedom of choice versus public safety. And it's really the core of public health. How do you balance the, the uh, rights of the individual with the interest and safety of the public? And this issue around travel certifications falls in that. Um, I, you still have to show yellow fever when you go internationally. It is completely uh, permissible under international law uh, to have these uh, travel certifications. The big risk, of course, or the big issue, of course, is that many countries will not have access to those vaccines. So you may see quite a divide where you are excluding um, many countries from forms of economic life on the basis of a decision that they they have uh, they cannot make they don't have access to the vaccines in the US context you know these types of certifications provide an incentive for people to get vaccinated um, and we have all sorts of limits on the way we allow people to travel in other circumstances I'm not opposed to, uh, imposing a travel certification in that context, either provided the societies affected actually have the ability to be vaccinated if they want to be. Thanks. Uh, our, our next viewer actually has kind of two sub questions. Uh, uh, they ask, are there any lessons that are unique to this particular pandemic compared to others in the past? And secondly, are you concerned about access to vaccines globally and in countries uh, least able to afford it. You've spoken a little bit to the second question already. Great. Um, so I often, I'll answer uh, your first question kind of in a, a variant of it, which is I'm often asked what has surprised me about this pandemic. And, you know, as Dave mentioned, if you decide to read the book, uh, it's not just me. Many everyone saw a potential pandemic coming. Um, you know, we've had near misses before. Um, it's uh, not surprising at all that we have had a deadly pandemic arise. We will have ones in the future, unfortunately. Um, what truly surprised me in this pandemic is despite all the preparation for that, uh, despite you know, the investments that we, we did have, how poorly governments responded. Um, and it really, uh, much of what was done in preparation for pandemics or epidemics or outbreaks was all left on the shelf. And that is a lesson that if our global safety relies on leadership, um, we are we're doomed. We need a more durable infrastructure uh, to guide our response in the future than the individual personalities of various leaders. That's not just a US comment, that's globally. I mean, there are many other nations that also have not done well. Um, so that's one. On the vaccine side, I'm deeply worried. I see this as a significant inflection point uh, for for global cooperation. So obviously if we don't have sufficient vaccines, the pandemic will persist. Uh, we may see more emergence of these uh, variants of concern, uh, persistence of the economic impacts, but given that we're a foreign policy, foreign affairs crowd, I'll throw out one last issue that if we cannot in the midst of a global crisis, 
share a life-saving medical intervention that is in the interest of all of us, all nations to share, what problem are we going to work on globally together? What are our prospects of any other collective action challenge that depends on making progress by nations cooperating? Are we, how are we possibly going to make ourselves safer from the next pandemic, address climate change, nuclear non-proliferation? If we cannot do this, it leaves a legacy that makes it hard to make progress on the many other areas where uh, the world needs to work together. Thank you. I, now, on that very thoughtful uh, end note, which does look to the future and, and the necessity uh, for countries to work together much better, I think we've kind of come to the end of our questions. Uh, Tom, super appreciate uh, your speaking to us and responding to our questions and uh, being on our program. And uh, I personally look forward to when you can come to Louisville and visit us and we can look at the next uh, chapter of this. So let me just join and say thank you very much. My Thanks pleasure. so much for having me. You're welcome. Thank you, Dave, and thank you, Tom. Actually, before I um, we close, we do have one question that came in um, before Dave ended it. Um, it's from one of our members who asked, how can we better counter the anti-science movement in the US? So if Tom, if you can address that and then um, for our audience, that'd be great. Great. Uh, so one area where we, we do have historically uh, in many countries, including the US, less, less trust is of, of science. Um, I, the issue there, in general, what we've learned about past pandemics around risk communication is to put experts forward. Um, if you read the documents that we put out around the H1N1 epidemic, they recommended putting the CDC forward uh, and relying on testimony from uh, those experts at the uh, outset, consistency, acknowledging when we don't know information, when the evidence is still emerging. Um, uh, it, it's lessons that unfortunately many nations struggled with in this context where we, we did not rely on experts uh, we weren't open about what we knew and what we didn't know, and we frequently uh, changed positions. And unfortunately, that will take some time to rebuild uh, by uh, employing the lessons that we've already learned from past risk communication. Great, thank Let you. Me make one yeah. last mention, and, and that is uh, to any of our uh, viewers, I would suggest that Googling Tom's name, uh, I did that and read a number of interesting articles that he's written in Foreign Affairs that I, uh, I think uh, anyone who found uh, these topics compelling would, would equally uh, be enriched by that. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. That's right. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, Thomas uh, also directs the Global Health Program at Council on Foreign Relations. So his research is certainly far and wide. And for our audience, you know, um, we the, there, there's so many topics and themes that can be explored in around this issue. And I, I feel that we've, uh, you know, kind of cut to some of those big ones. But if uh, you did not get a chance to get the book I hope you will consider getting uh, getting a copy for yourself. And uh, there's probably a number of issues and topics in there that you might be able to delve into a little bit more than what we have time for today. Um, now, also, we are uh, providing a free copy of the book uh, for all members who are going to be joining as a World Affairs Council member at the World Traveler or higher level. Um, that support is very important to us, but we think that the, um, the complimentary copy will be a great way to get you started with the World Affairs Council. So if you're interested, do go online on our worldkentucky.org uh, website and um, check out our membership page. So I just wanna say again, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Dave, for spending the evening with us and taking the time to really share your expertise with us. And um, I thank everybody else who's joined us for this program tonight. Um, I just want to say, please stay safe and healthy. And uh, we look forward to seeing all of you again very soon 
and next time. So have a wonderful and good evening. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tom. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.